Okay, so our next presenter, Mike Thomas, has a little bit more experience within the space than I do. Uh, with 30 years as a UK-based IT trainer, he's delivered thousands of courses and produced hundreds of written and video-based tutorials. Uh, he specializes in uh, various, various things within the Microsoft Office, especially Excel and Power BI. Uh, he's a fellow of the Learning and Performance Institute and has worked with many global and UK based companies uh, across a diverse range of in industries. In addition to training, he also designs and develops Microsoft Office based solutions that automate key business tasks and processes. Uh, yeah, welcome to Mike Thomas. Hello and welcome. My name is Mike Thomas. I'm an IT trainer with 30 plus years experience and I've been working with Excel for more years than I care to remember. For the past two or three years, I've been working with Power BI as well. The topic for my session is building an Excel-based soccer dashboard. Before I begin, I'd like to say a huge thank you to the organizers of this conference for one, organizing the conference, and two, allowing me to participate as a speaker. I hope that you find my session fun and useful. So that we know where we're aiming, this is the dashboard that I'm creating. It may not be the world's prettiest dashboard, but design isn't my thing. What's the phrase? I don't have a creative bone in my body. Given the time constraints I'm working under, and the fact this is really a training demo, it may not be as fully featured as it would be in the real world. And also, how I do things in the demo may not be exactly how I do them in the real world. My dashboard focuses on Manchester United from last season. I could have used this season, but as we're only in October, in fact, at the time of recording, it's the end of September, and not many matches have been played, that means there won't be that much data for the demos. In terms of where the data's coming from for my dashboard, I'm using the web. I've found a website that includes all the data that I need. So with that, let's get started. Now, what you see here looks like a blank Excel workbook. It is, but there's actually some data in it. The data is stored in the data model. For anyone who's not familiar with the data model, think of it as a container hidden away inside an Excel file that is used to store one or more tables of data. What are the benefits of storing the data in the data model rather than the worksheet grid? Well, that's a discussion for another day. Let me show you the data. So I'll click on the data menu and click on manage data model. That will open up the data model window. And in here, we have two tables. We have goal scored and we have league position. How did I get that data into the data model? Well, that's what I'm going to show you now because I have another set of data that I need to import. I've got the URL in this text file here. So I'll just copy the URL, close down the data model window in Excel and go to data from web. Paste the URL in and click OK. What Excel is doing now is connecting to that web page and it's bringing back a list of all of the tables that are on that web page. And as I click on the names of the tables, I get a preview of the data. The table that I want to bring the data in from is this one here, scores and fixtures. So I select it and I click the arrow next to load and select load two. And that brings up a dialog box. From this dialog box, I want to change the table option to only create connection, because if I leave it as table, it will bring the data into the spreadsheet, which I don't want it to do. And I tick add to the data model, and that's self-explanatory. It'll take the data and load it into the data model of this file. I click OK, and that's what it's doing. As well as loading the data into the data model, it's creating a query. And a query is simply a set of instructions that tells Excel where the data is, how it can connect to that data. And that queries and connections panel on the right is showing the names of all of the queries in this file. 
Now, I want to rename the one called Scores and Fixtures 2022 to 2023 Manchester United. Nothing wrong with it. It's just a bit long winded. So from that panel on the right, I will right click on the name of that query and click on Rename. And I'm going to call it Match Details and press Enter. It asks me to confirm that I want to rename it, which I will do. And I also will click the refresh button on the right hand side of that query so that it will update the name of the query in the data model. Once I've done that, I'll actually close that panel down. I can bring it back at any time by going to the data menu and choosing queries and connections. But right now I don't need it displayed. But what I do need to do is go back into the data model by going to data, manage data model. And there is the match details data that I've just imported. As you can see, the data needs tidying up, which I can do using the query editor, which is part of Power Query. It's not part of the data model. Before I do that, though, I'm going to create a link between the goals scored table and the match details table. The one of the main benefits of storing data in the data model is that you can create links between the tables and then create pivot tables where the data comes from multiple tables. I've got a column in each table that displays the date of the match. So there's the date there and there's the date there. Doesn't matter that the dates are in different formats. Behind the scenes, we have a date in each one of those columns. So what I'll do is I'll use that to create the link or relationship between the tables. If I click on the diagram view button up on the ribbon, I get the structure of the tables. So the data view button shows me the data. The diagram view button shows me the table structures. So all I need to do is click on date in one of the tables and drag the mouse to date in the other table. And that has created a connection between those two tables. I don't need to link the league position table up. In fact, I can't link the league position table up because I don't have a column in the match details or the goal score table that I can connect to. So that can just stay as a separate table in the data model without any links. Once I've done that, I will close down the data model window and I will open up the query editor by selecting data, get data, launch Power Query Editor. Select the match details table on the left. And the first thing I'll do is apply a filter because I'm only interested in the Premier League matches. So I'll click the filter button in the comp or competition column and only tick Premier League. What that means is when I close this query editor down, it doesn't physically delete the other rows. It just doesn't send them through to the data model. Then I'm going to remove the columns that I'm not interested in. So I will click on the Home tab and go to Choose Columns. And the columns that I want to keep are the date, the venue, the result, the goals for, the goals against, the opponent and the attendance. Those are the columns that I need for my dashboard. Now, I could have kept all of the columns and sent all the columns through to the data model. But the smaller your data model is in terms of number of columns, the better performance you get. I also need to change the GF and the GA columns. That's the goals for and the goals against columns so that Excel treats the data in there as numbers. At the moment, it's treating the data as text. And that's what the ABC next to the column headings is. So if I click on the ABC and select whole number, I'll do that for the goals against. It has automatically recognized the values in the attendance column as numbers, so I don't need to do anything with that. But if I now click on the close and load button on the home tab, that will close the query editor and load the amended data into the data model. 
And just to check it, on the Data tab, go to Manage Data Model. Go to the Match Details table, and there we go. You can see we've now got the amended data. So I can close down the Data Model window. So now we'll look at setting up the dashboard itself. I've got two tabs in this dashboard. I've got the Dashboard tab, and I've got the Scratchpad tab. The Dashboard tab is where the actual dashboard will be built. The scratch pad tab is for formulas and pivot tables and anything else that needs to be in the file, but I don't want to display on the actual dashboard. So I usually have a separate sheet for that. And I usually hide that sheet when I've finished developing the dashboard. On the dashboard sheet itself, you'll notice that I've turned the grid lines off. And to do that, you just go up to view and take the tick out of grid lines. And I've done that just to try and give the effect of a blank canvas. I know we all know that it's Excel and it's a spreadsheet grid, but it just makes it look a little bit cleaner. The next thing to do is to change the background color of the cells to green to match the color of a soccer pitch. But rather than selecting the cells and changing the background color, I'm going to add a rectangle onto my worksheet and change the color of that. My thinking here is to do with different screen sizes. As a dashboard designer, one problem you'll face is the many devices and screen sizes that users of your dashboard will have. Say I formatted A1 to Z40 to have a green background. Someone using a larger screen where they can see more rows and columns, will see a white background on those cells that are visible to them that haven't been formatted. Someone using a smaller screen will have to scroll to the right and left and up and down to see everything or use the zoom control at the bottom right. There's no ideal solution for this and I'm still going to have the same problem with a shape. If I was doing this in the real world where I had more time, I would write a macro that changes the zoom and resizes the rectangle and all the other elements on the dashboard. So if I click on insert, click on pictures and click on rectangles and choose the rectangle I want and then just click anywhere on the spreadsheet. Initially, it adds a square, but I can move that. I can resize it. I can color it. So I'm going to move it right up to the top corner of A1 and I'm going to resize it so it fits down to about row 40 and across to about column Z. I also want to change the color of it. So with it selected, go to shape format, shape fill and choose the color that I want to use, which is going to be that green there. I'll also turn the outline off. So again, with the shape selected, click on shape format, shape outline, no outline. I then want to add the Manchester United club badge. And to do that, go to insert pictures from this device. I have the image as a PNG file on my desktop, so I will select it and insert it. And it's quite big, so I will make it smaller. Just resize it and position it where I want it. I've also made sure that the image that I use is transparent. The last thing I want is a white background to show through on the green dashboard background. At the top of the dashboard, I want to have three boxes, each one containing a key statistic. In this case, total goal scored, average home attendance and current league position. And I will do this by adding rectangles and then putting the headings and the values in those rectangles. Click on insert, click on shapes and click on the first rectangle and then click anywhere in the spreadsheet. Now I know it's added a square and a blue square at that, but I'll change all that in a minute. So I'll position this where I want it and I will size it how I want it. And I'll go and change the color by going up to shape fill and choosing yellow 
and also turning the shape outline off, no outline. I'll then make a copy of that shape, just copy paste, and position this copy underneath the first one and make it taller. The reason I'm making it taller is because that is where the number is going to go. And then select both of those shapes. So click the first one, hold the shift key down and click the second one and select shape format, group, group. So the two shapes are now grouped as one object and I can move them around together. I want to create two more shapes just like that. Quickest way is just copy and paste and paste again and then position them where I want them. To make sure that they are equally distributed, I'll click on the first shape, shift click on the second, shift click on the third and then click on align, distribute horizontally and align align bottom. So they've now got the same gap between them and they're all aligned at the bottom. The next thing to do is to add the headings. Now I have the headings in column A of the scratch pad, so I can just connect the shapes to those cells. So I'll click on the first shape. I actually need to click twice. The first click selects the grouped shape. The second click selects just the top shape. With that shape selected, click into the formula bar, type an equal sign for a formula and click on scratch pad A1 and press enter. And then do a similar thing for the others. So click on the second shape and click on the smaller shape within the group shape. Click in the formula bar equals scratch pad a2, and then do the same thing for the third heading. Select the shape, formula bar equals scratch pad A3. I'm then going to format those shapes and format the text, particularly in the shape. So select the shape. Let's make the text red and make it bold, make it centered vertically and horizontally and change the size of the text to say 24 points and do the same with the others. Now to save time, I'm going to select the first one, click the format painter and click on the second shape and then do the same thing again for the third shape. So click on the shape, click the format painter and click on the shape. The lower shapes will also contain formulas and these formulas will reference data that's stored in the data model. Now, there are two ways to create these formulas, and I'll show you both. The first method is to use measures. Measures are special formulas normally used to calculate aggregations. In other words, a total, an average or a count on data that's stored in the data model. Having said that, measures can be used to generate other values. Measures are written using the DAX formula language, which certainly at a basic level is quite similar to Excel's formula and function language. So I will switch to the data model. Now, if I click data, you'll notice that the manage data model is grayed out. That's because I've got a shape selected. So if I click away from the shape, it's still grayed out. And that's because the green background is also a shape. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move the green shape slightly to the right. I'll move it back when I'm done, but at least now I can select a cell. Any cell will do. But as soon as I select a cell, the manage data model button is clickable. So I'll click on manage data model. I'll then click on the match details tab at the bottom and click into the formula bar at the top of the data model window. And what I'm going to do here is type a formula that adds up all the numbers in the GF column. It really is like if this data was in the spreadsheet cells, I'd just use the sum function on that column of numbers. 
So it's actually very similar, but you just are writing this formula inside the data model window. Every measure has to be given a name to identify it. So I'm going to call this measure total goals scored. You can call your measure anything you like, but I always try and name my measures appropriately. So after you've named the measure, type a colon followed by an equal sign, and then you type the actual calculation, which in this case is going to be sum, open brackets, and then the GF column in the match details table. Double click on that, close the brackets, and that's it. Press enter. Below the actual table, we have an area which is called the calculation area. Sometimes that area is not displayed. If it isn't, click the calculation button on the ribbon and that will display it. I'll also need to widen the first column because what you see in that calculation area in the first column is the names of any measures in this file plus the current value. Now I need to get this value into the scratch pad sheet. So I will close down the data model window. And to do that, I will create what's called a cube function. Cube functions are the conduit between the data model and the spreadsheet. They take a value generated by a measure and display it in a cell. Cube functions, by the way, are not DAX functions. They are Excel functions, but they reference data that's in the data model. So I'll go to B1 and put equals cube value. The first parameter for the cube value function is the connection, and it's always the same. It's open double quotes, this workbook data model, which I can just double click on, close double quotes. That never changes. Then a comma. And the second parameter is the measure that you want to load in to the cell. You start by putting double quotes, double click on measures, put a dot and double click on the name of the measure. Close double quotes and close brackets. So what I'm saying is go to the data model in this workbook and get the value of the total goal scored measure and put it into B1. So when I press enter, that's exactly what it does. If I then go back to the dashboard, what I want to do in this shape here is I want to grab the value from B1 in the scratch pad sheet. So I click into the formula bar, type equals, click on scratch pad, select B1 and press enter. And it's then taken the value that's in B1 and displayed it in that shape. I then want to format that shape as I've done with the other shapes. So I will make the text red. I will make it bold. I'll center it vertically and horizontally, and I'll change the size to 36. So what happens when the data on the web page updates? I'll need to go into this file and click data refresh all. And what that will do is it will connect to the web page. It will bring the data in. It will update the data model and it will automatically update the data on that uh, shape there. Now, although I could use measures to generate the values for the other two shapes, I'm going to do it a different way just to show you that there are two ways to do this. So if you don't feel comfortable writing DAX measures, there is an alternative. And that alternative is pivot tables. So if I go to the data model and in the match details table, we have an attendance column. What I want to do is calculate and display the average for just the home matches. So I'll close down the data model, go to the scratch pad, and go to a blank cell. I'll just go to E1. And in E1, I'm going to create a pivot table from the data model. So I'll click on insert, click the arrow under pivot table and select from data model. 
and I want to put the pivot table starting at E1. So I'll click on OK. Into the values box, I'm going to add attendance from the match details. So open up the match details table, find attendance and drag it into the values box. And that has given me the total attendance from all the matches. I'm going to change that to average by right clicking on it, selecting summarize values by and changing it to average. But I only want it for the home matches. So again, in the match details table, I will drag venue to filters and set the filter here to home. And then E4 is showing me the figure that I want to put on the dashboard. So I will click on this shape here, the lower shape in the average attendance and create a formula directly in the formula bar, which references the scratch pad sheet and E4. I then want to format that figure. So I'm going to make it red. I'm going to, it already is centered, but I want to make it bold and I'll make it a larger font. What I can't do from here, because you'll notice that the number options are grayed out, is I can't format how that number's displayed. So if I wanted commas and no decimal places, I'd have to go back to the scratch pad sheet and format that cell and that pulls it through. So let's format that as comma with no decimal places. And if I go back to the dashboard, you can see that that format, that number format has now pulled through. The final statistic I want to add is the league position. Now, if I go back into the data model, there is a table called league position and there is only one record and one column. When I originally imported this data, there were more rows and there was more columns, but all the information that I didn't need has been filtered out through Power Query. So all I want is the data from the one and only row in the RK column. I think RK stands for rank, but that is the name of the column on the web page. So let's close down the data model, go to the scratch pad sheet, go and find a blank cell, let's say H1, and create a pivot table. And all I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up the league position table and drag RK into the rows box. And in H2, I have the value I want. If the web page got updated, if the team moved down the league or up the league, I can do a refresh in here and that will update the data model and update the pivot tables. So I'll go back to the dashboard, click on that shape there, click in the formula bar, type in equals, click on scratch pad and type H2. And then format as I've been doing before. So let's make it red, bold and 36 points. The next thing to add to the dashboard is a table that shows the top five goal scorers. So if I switch to the data model, this information is going to come from the goals scored table. You can see that we've got a column called scorer, and that's the name of the person who scored each goal. I'll need a pivot table to count the number of goals scored by each player and then filter to display the top five. I could add the pivot table to the dashboard sheet, but if I do, its position will be constrained because pivot tables have to live in cells. The text boxes and the logo, they float on top of the cells, meaning I can place them anywhere. So I'm going to create the pivot table on the scratch pad sheet and then use one of Excel's hidden gems, the camera tool, to display it on the dashboard. I'll click on the scratch pad sheet and I'm going to go to A10 and create the pivot table there. Now, why aren't I creating the pivot table starting on row one, where all the other pivot tables are? Well, you'll see why in a minute. So I'll insert a pivot table using the data model. 
and I'm going to go to the goal score table and drag scorer into rows. That will give me the names of all the scorers. But as I said, what I want to see is the number of goals scored by each person. Because I want to do a count, I can use any of the columns in that table where I know there are no blanks and scorer has no blanks. In fact, I think most, if not all of those columns have no blanks. So I could use any of those columns, but I'll use scorer. So I'll drag scorer into values and that automatically shows me how many goals each person has scored. I want to put that list in descending order based on the number of goals. So I'll right click on one cell in column B and sort into largest to smallest. And then I want to only show the top five. So to do that, I'll click on the filter button and select value filters, top 10. Change the 10 to a five and click OK. So that is now showing me the top five goal scorers. The next thing I'll do is change the headings. So I'll change the word row labels to player and count of scorer to number of goals and align that number of goals to the right. I'll also hide the totals. I don't want to see the totals on the dashboard by going to design, clicking on grand totals and turning off the totals. I also want to make the font bigger, so I'll select all of the cells and let's just make the font 16 points and then just make the columns wider. Now, of course, what I want to do is make sure that when that pivot table is updated, the columns do not shrink back to their default size. So if I click in the pivot table and click on analyze options, I can untick the box auto fit column widths on update. So when the pivot table is updated via a refresh, the column widths will not change. That's that's one of my big annoyances with pivot tables. You can actually change the default for all your pivot tables, but I haven't on this computer. So I'm doing it just for this pivot table. Also, whilst I'm in the options, I don't want the filter button to display on the dashboard. So I'll go to the display tab and I'll untick display field captions and filter drop downs. And when I click OK, the filter button has gone, but also the text has gone. There is a solution to that, and the solution is to hide the row with the headings. And then type my own headings on the row above. So I'll type player and number of goals and then format those so that they match what I had before. I'll make them bold. I'll make them 16 points. Um, I'll make them yellow background and red text and align the number of goals heading to the right. And that's why I didn't put the pivot table on row one because I knew that I was going to have to hide the row with the headings and that would have hidden everything on row one. Now, how do I get that pivot table onto the dashboard? Well, this is where the camera tool comes in. The camera tool allows you to take a screenshot of part of the spreadsheet and that screenshot actually becomes a live screenshot. So any changes to the underlying pivot table will automatically update the screenshot. The camera tool is hidden by default and it can only go on the quick access toolbar. So I will click on the little arrowhead to the right of the quick access toolbar, the quick access toolbar being that little mini toolbar just above the main menu and click on more commands. Change the commands from to commands not in the ribbon and scroll down this alphabetical list, select camera, and add it. And once the camera's 
added to the quick access toolbar, I'll select the pivot table, click on the camera and just click anywhere in the spreadsheet. And you can see it's created a screenshot of what I had selected. But as I said, it's a live screenshot. If you look in the formula bar, it's actually referencing A9 to B15. Now I need to get that screenshot onto the dashboard and I literally just cut and paste and position it where I want. But you can see now we have a problem. When you move the screenshot to a different sheet, it doesn't update the formula. So it thinks I want the screenshot to reference A9 to B15 on this sheet. But actually, I want to reference A9 to B15 on the Scratchpad sheet. So I will delete out the formula from the formula bar, type in equals, go to the Scratchpad and highlight A9 to B15 and press enter. And that looks much better. And I'll position that wherever I want it. Now, I want to be able to filter the dashboard by home matches and away matches. So I'm going to add a slicer. Slicers are attached to pivot tables. So if I switch to the scratch pad and I select the pivot table containing the top scorers, I will click on Analyze, Insert Slicer. I'll then click on All at the top here so that I can see all of the tables that are in the data model. And from the match details, I'll click on Venue and click OK. So what that slicer allows me to do is it allows me to apply a filter to one or more pivot tables. At the moment, the slicer is only connected to this pivot table here. So if I click the away button, it applies a filter and it shows me the goal scored by those players where the team played away. If I click on home, it changes the numbers to show me the goals scored at home matches. And if I click the button at the top right, that clears the filter and that shows me the goal scored by the top five players, whether the team was playing home or away. Of course, I actually want the slicer to be on the dashboard. So I will select the slicer and cut and paste it to move it onto the dashboard and position it wherever I want it to go, which I'll say is there. Now, it doesn't need to be as tall as that. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it a little bit wider. And on the slicer menu up here, I'm going to change the number of columns to two. So what that means is instead of having one column of buttons, I've got two columns of buttons. And it doesn't need to be as tall as it was. So when I click on these buttons here, what it's doing is it's actually changing the underlying pivot table. It's applying a filter to the underlying pivot table. And then that is pulling through to this copy of the pivot table. Now, what if I wanted to change the color of the buttons? Well, on the slicer menu, I can choose from one of these different color schemes or I can create my own color scheme. So I'm going to choose this orange one here and it still works in exactly the same way. But at the moment, the slicer is only connected to this pivot table here, which means that it's only updating this element of the dashboard. So if I go to the slicer menu, and I click on Report Connections, I can connect it up to the other two pivot tables that are in this file on the Scratchpad sheet. One of them is controlling the attendance and the other is controlling the league position. So when I click OK, now as I click the buttons, it is changing the data on this pivot table or this screenshot of the pivot table, and it's changing the values in the other two pivot tables, which are pulling through to these shapes here. The total goals scored isn't changing because it's been generated by a measure 
not a pivot table. The formula in the shape is referencing B1 on the scratch pad sheet. B1 on the scratch pad sheet is the result of a cube function, which is displaying the result of a measure. If we want the total goal scored to change, depending on which slicer button is selected, I would have to create a pivot table to show the total goal scored, connect the slicer to the pivot table, and change the cell that the shape is pulling its value from. Another option would be to create two measures, one to calculate goal scored at home, and the other to calculate goal scored away. But that would be a more complex solution. The final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drag the green rectangle back so that it's right up against the left hand side and the top of the spreadsheet. Now that's going to cause me a problem because if you look on the data tab on the ribbon, the refresh all button is greyed out. There is a shortcut key to doing the refresh all, but not everybody can remember shortcut keys. So what I'm going to do instead is add a button onto the spreadsheet to run a macro. So let's start by recording a macro. I'm just going to move the green rectangle to the right a little bit and select a cell and then go to developer record macro. And I'll call the macro update dashboard and store it in this workbook. And all I want the macro to do is the equivalent of data refresh all. So I'll just record data refresh all. Once I've done that, I will stop the recorder. Developer, stop recording. And then move the green rectangle back to the left hand corner. Then I will insert a shape. Again, I'll use a rectangle. I'll move the shape over underneath the football club logo, resize it, and I'll also make it a red background. Double click inside the shape so I can type some text and I'll just type refresh and make that text bigger and maybe make it bold and centered. And then to attach a macro to that button, I just right click on the shape, select assign macro, click the name of the macro and click OK. So now whenever I click that button, it will perform the refresh. And that way I don't have to worry about the user not being able to select the refresh all button. The only thing I will have to do now is save the file as a macro enabled workbook. OK, so that brings us to the end of the session. Thanks for watching. And even if you're not a soccer fan, I hope you were able to take something away from the session. If you want to contact me with any questions, please do so. All my details are here. And as I say at the end of my YouTube videos, have an excellent day. Okay, thank you very much for that, Mike. That was uh, really fascinating. So uh, just looking through um, the first question was, um, I know that a few of the, uh, there's been some issues with uh, pivot tables. Some, I've seen some people having some issues, issues with some pivot tables recently. I was wondering if you would have had any issues with that. Uh, I haven't, no, not, not at all. Um, I know there are a number of issues with uh, pivot tables on the Mac um, in terms of the fact that it doesn't uh, have exactly the same functionality as, as pivot tables on Windows. And uh, I'm a Mac user. Well, I'm actually both. Um, I, I, I use the Mac in my personal life, but um, if I'm doing any developments for clients, unless they are Mac specific, I try and do it on Windows. But no, I've not come across any issues with pivot tables. Okay, uh, interesting. Um, my next question, I was just wondering, 
what are the most common pitfalls that you find people fall into when they're developing dashboards? Like when you're looking at other people's dashboards, what are the most common things that mistakes that people make? Uh, I think, as I said in the in the video, I think one of the things is uh, trying to get the sizing right, and I don't think there's any real answer to, uh, answer for that. Um, the, the, you can write some VBA code to set the zoom um, properly for that particular device, but there's no real answer. If you know, if you go back, if you go back years, what I say to people is when dashboards first became popular people like Stephen Few would be saying, try and fit everything on one screen. And that was fine when we all worked at, you know, 800 by 600 on a on a standard monitor. But the the, the number of devices, the number of screens um, is, 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 I guess, one of the pitfalls these days. And I think the other the other pitfall is trying to cram all the information onto uh, onto a single screen. I don't think that's possible now. Um, and, you know, if you think about something like Power BI, Power BI has deliberately got multiple tabs. So spread your information out. And I would do the same thing on Excel. I don't see why, you know, Stephen Few would probably crucify me for this, but I don't see why you would, you should have everything crammed on one page, create separate files or, or create separate tabs, spread your information out. There's nothing wrong with, with white space. Um, and, 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 and I also think uh, one of the pitfalls is that people try and put things on just for the sake of it because they want to impress mm. people, they want to impress their boss. Oh, look, I can do a, a gauge chart, for example. Um, and, and maybe it's not the right type of, of visual. So keep it simple. That's what I would say. Keep it simple. Um, I think for me, those are the pitfalls. Yeah, yeah. And I, I totally agree with your comment about the sizing as someone who uses an ultra wide monitor. Uh, <laughs> it's a massive, it's very annoying receiving, uh, but there's not really a huge amount that you can do, uh, do about no. that kind of thing. No. So are you a Manchester United fan? I certainly am, yes. So my yeah. next question is, how do you feel about their current season? <laughs> Ooh, well, they did well at the weekend. We'll see. We'll see how the rest of the season goes. Yeah, I was I was trying to work out um, what what topic to do on the dashboard, whether I should do a Premier League dashboard or whether I should just focus on United. And in the end, I decided just to focus on United. But the biggest thing was actually trying to find some some decent data sources. I know there's a million data sources out there on the web, but uh, you know when you want to do import from web because you want to make it easy to, to refresh rather than yeah. having to download a, a CSV file from a website or something. You've got to find one where you can just using Power Query actually import the data easily. There's so many websites out there that don't use standard HTML tables behind the scenes, which means that when you try and do import from web, it's not going to recognize the data. I just want to say it's a uh, brilliant session. Thank you, Mike. You're very welcome. Glad you enjoyed it.